Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Apologies for speaking in English to those of you that uh, were hoping I might be able to speak in German. Um, I'm here to talk about big data today, and you've heard a lot about this. Um, the CVIT conferences have always been a, a place where great conversations happen about technology. And we, we think big data is obviously one of those key trends that is worth discussing, um, but how, how is it progressing? Where are we in big data, and how should we think about it today, given all the changes? Um, so it's not something that's new. It's obviously something we've been talking about for a while. Uh, but it's been positioned as this great answer for everything. Um, big data can solve all of your problems, um, better medical records to smarter cities to everything. Uh, huge investments have been made. Um, according to IDC, almost $125 billion dollars will be spent on hardware, services, and software around big data this year. But big data is starting to really hit a, uh, the, the, in 2013, it started to be at the peak of what Gartner calls its hype cycle. Um, and it was sort of emerging early on. By, by now, however, we're starting to see that it's sort of heading down to that trough of disillusionment, as it didn't fulfill all those amazing, crazy promises that people expected for it. Uh, in fact, Internet of the Things is at the top of the hike cycle now, if you want to wait for that for two years to be in the trough of disillusionment. So we want to understand why is Big Dave starting to fall out of favor? Um, so we did a survey at the beginning of this month. We asked 1,500 employed adults, 18 and over, in Germany, the U.S., and China um, to give us their opinions about big data uh, on the value and the usage of big data at their companies. And here's what they said. Overall, people have reported that their companies have spent a lot of money on big data. Um, half of Germans and 42 percent, uh, half of Germans and Americans, 42 percent of Chinese report that they're spending large sums of money. And I'm sure many of you today are very aware of all the spending that's going on around big data, so obviously this is not surprising. However, what we were surprised by was that a lot of people feel these big data investments have not paid off. And this is why you start to see that uh, heading down to that trough of disillusionment. So people ramped up their spending, they got all excited about it, and then it just doesn't feel like it's delivered on what it's promised. Now, um, half of people do believe big data has solved some problems, but half don't believe it solved any problems, which is pretty shocking. Uh, the Chinese seem to be more optimistic about it. Uh, we're not quite sure why. Maybe it's... Uh, they're seeing better results from what their implementation is. We really have to do more surveys to figure out the answer to that. But at least for the Germans and Americans, um, there is quite a bit of disillusionment um, about, about big data and big data investments. Um, we think part of the reasons why people are disillusioned, obviously these expectations were too high. Um, it's been sold as one of the cures for every business ailment. Um, a, a recent study by the Association of uh, Information and Image Management said that while a majority of those said it was too early to judge the return on investment, those that did said that the big data ROI had been small or limited to specific projects. So it, it sort of, it, just expectations in reality have not been met. It's, there's sort of too much data. It's hard to kind of make sense of all the signal through the noise. There's, we've actually started collecting so much that people have a hard time keeping track of it and using it. And it's too siloed, but it's not connected to each other. So the, there, the data is in lots of places. We're collecting lots of big data, but it's hard to connect them and actually make decisions from it. And so the other thing we'd say is not being at the top of that Gartner hype cycle is not such a bad thing. It means we're actually starting to 
understand the pluses and minuses of something and get way to it to become a much more of a mainstream technology. But I think in order to benefit from big data, you have to look beyond the hype and find the best way uh, to use it. So I want to start and talk about the way we think about big data. And it's a little bit differently than you may have heard before. So the first is what I would call uh, implicit data. And so implicit data is what we generally think of as big data. This is the data that's collected when you're uh, just by activity, whether it's clicking on things on a website or on a phone, your activity on a mobile phone. It's, it's just the implicit data that happens when you do things, when you listen to a song, when you buy things. You're not actively involved in it. The other kind is explicit data. We'll talk more about this later, but this is when you actually tell something to somebody that it's explicit. So um, implicit data is generally thought of as big data because you can get it at scale. There's so much of it going around, and we're capturing and measuring everything in people's lives. It's also the kind that gets people creeped out. It's the kind that makes people nervous about data privacy. Um, and obviously, everywhere in the world is. Uh, Bill McDermott just said, data privacy is a huge issue. People don't like the fact that ever, all their activities are being observed. It's particularly an issue here in Germany, but it, it's something people everywhere in the world are very concerned about. You know, for example, this sort of creepy thing, um, this, this man, his credit card company knows he's getting a divorce before he does. They know this because the money he's spending on things like teeth whitening, gym membership, and hotel rooms. Um, implicit data can predict your divorce. It's useful, uh, but kind of scary. Um, every major retailer from grocery stores to banks to shipping services, everyone's trying to analyze all of this data to understand what their consumers are doing. Um, and so they can more efficiently market to them, so they can more efficiently serve them. So that's not a bad thing, but it can feel, like I said, uh, disconcerting. Large German retailers like Otto, uh, for example, use big data analytics to estimate their demand planning. And it's been very successful for them. They've improved um, how, how they stock their stores, uh, reducing the amount of inventory they have to carry, yet still serving customers. So that's a great thing to be able to use big data for uh, in a way that actually improves the business for auto at the same time servicing consumers. And so that's the power of big data until it gets it wrong. I'll give you an example of how you can get this wrong. So, about six years ago, Google announced that it was doing something called Google Flu Trends, that they could predict the flu based on how people were searching. Again, this is kind of that implicit big data. Lots of scale, Google searches. They could see when people were looking for flu medicine and therefore flu treatments. That was going to predict the spread of the flu. Uh, and it was faster than other research because it was as people were having this happen. So it sounded great. However, four years later, um, the flu outbreak had claimed its latest victim, Google Flu Trends. It turns out that Google Flu Trends was really not as predictive as they'd hoped um, and was overestimating the flu by 2x the amount. So while the announcement of Google Flu Trends got a lot of attention, the failure of it did not. That's not to say it wasn't an interesting idea, but I think you can get overly caught up in correlations uh, and not understand sort of causal effects. And it turned out that actual, the, um, the actual traditional method, method of measuring the flu, the survey data, was actually better in this case. Another example of this where you see implicit data getting it wrong is shopping recommendations. Um, you know, for example, if you bought something as a gift for someone or something for someone at work, often your shopping service will give you recommendations based on that thing you just bought. Again, this is that implicit data. It doesn't really know that you want more items like this. It just knows that you bought it. Well, unfortunately, if you've bought a lot of um, 
gifts, your recommendations will be wrong. And so this is an example where, you know, big data has a hard time kind of correcting when it's just implicit data. And you're never going to get the right music for people if you uh, just sort of guess what they like. Uh, my background before I was at SurveyMonkey was in the music business, and we saw that people who just sort of tried to guess what people liked um, would fail pretty miserably because uh, it's very hard to guess what people like. You really have to ask them. So there's tons and tons of this implicit data being captured everywhere, um, but more data doesn't always lead to better insights. And I think if you really want to know what kind of music or gifts people like or uh, how they're feeling, um, you really have to ask them, which is, leads you to explicit data. And explicit data is just that. It's explicit. It's fully revealed or expressed. Someone has told you how they're feeling versus you guessing based on their behavior. And this is obviously not creepy for people. They know they volunteered their information, so it has a lot of benefits that way. Um, so what has been the issue with explicit data as being part of the notion overall of big data? Well, the issue with it has been that it's traditionally been time-consuming, expensive, not scalable. Um, it was often done with uh, non-electronic means to capture this data, or if it was, it was very cumbersome and expensive to do so. Um, but technology is changing that. So what the internet allows is people to gather this explicit data at scale. The ability to ask people questions, to get them to rate things, to give you reviews, that is the kind of explicit feedback that is now possible uh, that wasn't possible in the la up until the last few years. And so when you review something on Yelp and you let everyone else know what you like, you're creating explicit big data at scale. SurveyMonkey, this is our business. Um, we, we get um, over 3 million completed surveys every day from all over the world. Um, 29 million questions get answered every day. Um, this is kind of that explicit big data at scale. And so I think that's the change in the, in the paradigm, is the ability to capture these uh, opinions from individuals at scale. And it, if you do that right, it can be, it's really valuable. So let's look at, how, at an example of how Google got it right. Uh, Google does in sophisticated employee data tracking, and they want to understand about their lives. And the team was analyzing uh, from Google, um, they were looking at employee turnover, and they wanted to see why they were losing women faster than men, and it was particular one group of, uh, uh, a particular uh, segment of their women employees. And they surveyed the pro the, their employees, um, and they realized they didn't have a woman, women problem. They had a new mom problem. And it turned out that new mothers found that the 12-week uh, maternity leave wasn't satisfactory. And that was causing more of them to leave, either before their pregnancy or, or, or soon thereafter. And so Google initiated a five-month maternity program based on this survey data. So it started with the implicit data. They used the explicit data to kind of figure out why. And uh, they've improved their uh, employee retention among women uh, pretty dramatically since then. And they've obviously kept themselves as one of the best places to work. Uh, another example, uh, for the last couple of years, um, the market obviously for print magazines has been shrinking, um, and clearly Germany has been no stranger to that. And some of the best magazines in Germany have seen their print circulations drop uh, fairly consistently. Uh, it turns out that, that, so that the implicit data was circulation was dropping, and obviously that was happening. But they actually did um, a survey, uh, and realized that people's reading habits had changed. 
and that rather than printing on Monday, the traditional publication day, printing on Saturday, uh, sorry, on Friday, was going to actually make a big difference at, as to when people read magazines. And so uh, th they've changed the publishing days. They've seen an improvement in their circulation numbers as a result. Uh, again, the implicit data of people just not buying them would have just felt, fell in with a trend, but by shifting uh, their behavior based on the survey data, they were able to actually make a big improvement in their business. Uh, another example is uh, Harris Interactive in Germany did some work on, on video ads and YouTube skippable ads. And if you just looked at the data, you would have thought that skipping an ad was a bad thing for, uh, for advertisers. And most people would say, well, I don't want my ad skipped. Um, so that's the implicit data is the skip rate. And the more skips you have, you would assume it was bad. However, um, Harris's work showed that, in fact, the people who chose to skip the ad had a much higher recall rate and interest in the brand than the people who didn't skip it, probably because they were interacting with the video and they actually had to think about, okay, I want to skip this ad right now. Maybe they were already aware of it, but regardless, the, the skip rate was actually positively correlated with uh, remembering the ad and being interested in the brand, not negative. And so you would only get that data by asking consumers and getting them to tell you their brand preferences. At SurveyMonkey, we use both implicit and explicit data to run our business. Uh, we look at all sorts of things, from the number of questions people are asking to the number of surveys they send out. Uh, we look at where people are coming into our business, free, and pay, free to paid conversion, all lots of implicit data. But we don't rely strictly on those things either. We do a lot of surveys of our consumers. We understand, um, obviously, customer satisfaction, why people would cancel, uh, what they're planning to do when they, when they do cancel in the future, uh, feedback on the product and features. And so we combine kind of what we're seeing in implicit data with explicit data to make better decisions. One of those uh, examples for us was uh, a, an idea called our question bank. So we found that uh, new users were struggling sometimes to figure out how to get their first survey created. We could see that in the implicit data, but we didn't know why. When we asked them why, it turned out that they just didn't know how to get started. They didn't know how to ask that first set of questions. So we built a question bank library of questions that are created by our survey methodology experts. Um, we have over 2,000 questions in there in, uh, I think, 10 different languages that allow people to get started and create their survey and, and, and get going to get the first one started. And once they get the first one started, they're more likely to come back um, and stay as customers for us. And so, but we needed the, the insights of both the implicit and the explicit data to make that uh, decision on the product decision. It was a good one for us. We think you can use technology to update this very traditional process of asking people questions. It's what we all do in our daily lives. We all ask people questions all the time. But using technology to ask those questions at scale to make a better decision is, uh, we think, really important. And it needs to go alongside what we traditionally have thought of as big data and implicit data is this idea, this concept of explicit data at scale to make better decisions. Uh, and companies of all size have the ability to use this, to be able to do in-depth understanding of their employees, their customers, their partners. And they can integrate this with other data sources. So for example, for us, we've now integrated with companies like Salesforce. So you can imp integrate your implicit data that you've collected with Salesforce uh, with your explicit survey results and understand which of your customers are actually having a good experience and, and then be able to take actions based on that. We think gut feel and intuition are being replaced by data every day. Uh, but just using one of these types of data can be dangerous. We think you need the, in order for it to work best, you need to combine the uh, implicit data to give you the what of what's happening and the explicit data, the why. One of my favorite books 
which most of you have not heard of before, is a book called Exit Voice and Loyalty. It's about 50 years old, uh, written by a guy named Albert Hirschman. But he describes really this framework uh, in a very, very concise way. The book is called Exit Voice and Loyalty. And he talks about, sort of from an economics perspective, these two concepts of exit and voice. Exit is people don't like your product, let's say, uh, you, you, you make cereal in the grocery store and you've changed the formula and you're not really sure what people's reception is, but over time you start to see some degradation in your sales. But you don't know really what's causing it. It could be competition in the stores, it could be other things going on. It's very hard to tell what's happening. Um, but it might turn out that actually what was happening was exit, that people were leaving from your product. The other option is voice, where people speak up and say, hey, you've changed my cereal. I don't like it. I'm upset. Don't do that. This was obviously very powerful for Coca-Cola when they changed to new Coke and customers complained. That difference between whether people speak up, voice, or exit uh, is um, loyalty. And so the fundamentally, uh, you want to build loyalty because you really want to encourage voice. You really want, what, no matter what your business is, you want your customers, your employees, you want everyone to speak up and tell you, hey, we like something, we don't like something. Learning about it through exit is too slow and is not going to get you to the right answer. And so we look at these as sort of you know, descriptions of, in some ways, implicit and, and explicit data. Implicit data will tell you what's happening, but it won't tell you why it's happening, and you may not capture the why without, without actually asking people. And engaging in those conversations and then doing something about them really engenders loyalty. So responding to voice and then taking actions on it is the thing you can do to encourage more voice and more loyalty. I think the, the main lesson that we need to take away is that we have to listen. If you don't listen, you can see what happens. I think not to single out one particular company, but um, our friends at BlackBerry um, made some major mistakes. They just assumed that people were always going to want their email and their device. They assumed their customers was just... Um, people who ran IT departments. They thought people didn't need apps. Uh, and in fact, um, people at RIM didn't believe that a color screen was necessary because who needed a color screen for reading email? And if they had sort of asked their customers or listened to their customers, they would have heard a very different story. They would have heard very loyal customers who said, I love BlackBerry, but this isn't working and you need to change. But unfortunately, they didn't listen, and the company has gone through, a, obviously, a major uh, turmoil. Uh, hopefully, they will come out of it um, on the back end, but it will probably never be the same level of usage or dominance that it had before. Technologist and author David Weinberger said that markets are conversations. Customers want to be asked, and they want their opinions to be heard. Everyone talks about customer centricity. We all know most companies have a long way to go to get there. But if you encourage your customers and your employees to give you feedback, you will be starting down that right path. Make it easier for them to tell you what they think. Issues like private, privacy and creepiness disappear when they're engaged in the conversation. And people feel empowered and loyal when they're recognized and have a voice. In turn, your big data will become more actionable and find its voice. Thank you very much. I have time if there's any, uh, a, a couple questions, to take a couple questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay, yeah. We've got time, but we can take um, questions from the audience if you like. Um, and while we're waiting, maybe if you can raise your hand, let us know if you've got questions. I've got a question for you, talking about implicit, explicit yep. data. Um, you know, it's good that you're here the first day of the week, because what you're basically telling us is big data 
is not the panacea. It's not the answer to everything that a lot of people on this stage have been telling us the last <laughs> couple of years. Yeah. Um, it, it, are a lot of people surprised when you tell them that big data is not the savior? <laughs> I think, look, I think um, big data is useful. So to say it's not useful, uh, but I think just relying on sort of implicit data leads you to correlations without causation. Yeah. And I think that is dangerous. And I think also this disillusionment we're seeing a little bit where people are, had expected everything from big data and, and all of a sudden their businesses would magically be transformed. First of all, it's hard. Yeah. It's not going to come quickly. And second of all, it's not going to work if you just look at that implicit data. You actually have to ask people. Well, what about the notion, and we, and we hear this a lot, um, about governments taking a lot of, um, you know, a lot of metadata, for example. Yeah. Um, aren't you, basically what you're saying, you, you are proof that governments should not be collecting all of this data because they really can't draw reliable conclusions from it, right? Yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's, there's a lot of unreliable judgments being made by just that, that metadata being collected. Right. And I think it also lends itself to all these privacy issues yeah. that people have. Mm -hmm. And versus if I ask you questions, you don't have to answer. But right. if you answer, you know that your information is going to get used to help people make some kind of decision. So people tend to be pretty forthright and, you know, actually try to help uh, particularly governments or brands or uh, companies that they care about to actually improve their product. That's why people respond to these things. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it sort of turns it on its head. If you can collect that data at scale, yeah. um, you, you can actually get people pretty involved in that change process and all of a sudden the data that they're giving you um, they're doing it willingly, they're doing it knowingly, they feel good about it, they actually want change to happen. Yeah. So it's, it's just a different thought process. I mean, I, I think maybe a lot of people will be interested in, in, in the notion that big data works if people are working with you in, in, in giving information about them, right? Yes. Voluntarily, knowingly, all those things get, now they not only get past the privacy issues, um, but they make people feel more engaged. Just the fact that you've asked somebody the questions sure. actually makes them feel better towards your product, your company. It's amazing how many companies don't ask their consumers what they think yeah, exactly. or their employees what right. they think. So just asking and then taking that data and then saying, hey, we heard you and we're going to do something about it creates a very positive cycle. What does, what does your research tell us, for example, when we go and do a search on Google um, the, these advertisements come up that have something to do with the search that I did last night before, you know, before I had dinner yeah. or something. Um, most of the time, those searches are connected, or, or these advertisements are connected to what I was looking for, but um, but not always. Yeah. I mean, is Google, are you know, are they missing the mark there more th often than we think? Yeah, I don't know. It's sort of hard to say, but I do think it probably relates to that same thing that yeah. I just mentioned about Amazon yeah. and shopping recommendations, right. where it's sort of like maybe you typed the wrong thing in. Exactly. Right? Or maybe you thought you were looking for... Um, for, for one thing that was a similar name and it ended up being something else. And again, you just don't know. Or maybe you were doing it for, on, maybe someone else was using your computer, exactly. right? And right. so those, those, there's a lot of errors that pop up in that implicit big data that then come back at you and feel uncomfortable. Um, and also not like, hey, I'm being understood. So. Um. One more question before we let you go. What does this mean for companies that are looking to generate advertising sales through this? I mean, and get back to this point. Yeah. Let, let's say if I were doing a Google search on something um, that, uh, a topic that I don't like, something that um, I have a very negative attitude towards, and then tomorrow I log on and Google has all these ads about that product, that's going to make me think, you know, it's going to create a negative a reaction, neg yeah, right? Yeah. And if I'm an advertiser, um, I'm, I'm not going to want 
the person sitting at the computer to have any negative feelings at all by my banner. Right. So how can Google or how can anybody say, we've got the analytics to guarantee that we will not be responsible for negative feelings? Uh, I, I think they probably have to ask. Right, I think they probably have to ask, and you do see people doing this in advertising. Is this ad relevant to you? Yeah. Yes or no? Right, but, we, know, but we're not asked that though. Sometimes, some, some, some places in advertising, they do ask, okay. is this, this is, you know, what is your feeling about this ad? Yeah. Right, and I think that is very helpful to kind of, I mean, I don't think people dislike advertising. I think they dislike advertising that's not relevant to them. I agree. And that the creative is bad and that interrupts whatever they're trying to do. But if you can deliver, you know, advertising that's targeted to you, that's, that's um, not interrupting you, advertising is useful information for people, but you just got to get them the right advertising. And so some of it is asking people, hey, was this the right ad? Let, let's ask people before we let you go. Raise your hands. How many people here appreciate or like advertising that pops up while you're doing a search on the internet. Raise your hand. Does anyone like the advertising? I've got one hand here. <laughs> Not a lot of buyers That's the there. answer to the question. All right. <laughs> All Dave, right. thank you very thank much. Thank you for we having appreciate me. It. Give thank Dave you. a round of applause. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you. you.